it's a kind of a very multi-layered uh, area of the law. Um, well, from one perspective, it's pretty straightforward. They're basic principles. You know, when we looked at address possession last week, um, they're principles that have been thrashed out in the case law that apply across the board to any easement, no matter how you're actually uh, going to achieve, you know, uh, your claim to the easement. So that's pretty okay. And then there are some technicalities in terms of how the easements are actually granted or reserved. Anyway, I'll go into that um, probably in the, the second class. And then I'm just going to kind of graph it out with, with a diagram. And it would have been kind of pretty straightforward had it not been for two factors. One is that there's been a House of Lords case in 2007 in which there was um, an appeal from a Scottish court about what they call servitudes. Now, servitudes are the equivalent of easements, but obviously they come from Roman law. And so if you're just reading the academic commentary from like English, um, English journals or whatever, they're just pretty straightforward and they're calling this right an easement. And there has been huge controversy about this in Scotland because the Scottish Law Commission has said that their equivalent of easements are now closed. You can't make any more. And this particular type of easement, you certainly could never grant this particular type of easement like in, in their equivalent of, of what they call uh, servitudes. So the House of Lords has overruled that and thrown open Scottish law. So you can imagine in a political climate where they're all kind of moving towards independence, I mean, not that they're necessarily going to opt for independence because one of the things, I mean, I've spoken to a lot of people there, and um, one of my friends in Glasgow, I, I sort of asked her straight up on it, and people like, you know, are you really going to go for independence? And she said, well, one of the things that's going to make us sort of think twice about it is the experience of Ireland. And I was there, oh, God, that's great. <laughs> um, because there's this kind of cultural thing that, like Britain, um, well, England, the Westminster Parliament gets an awful lot of money in from the oil up around Aberdeen. But apparently they won't tell Scotland, they won't tell the Scottish Parliament how much money they actually bring in, but they fund them every year. So there's this sort of big brother kind of relationship that, like the Scottish, are deemed to be incapable of taking care of themselves. And so they have to have this big brother. So there's an awful lot of resentment. And in a whole host of different areas of the law now, Scotland is kind of um, forging its own course. So you can imagine to have the House of Lords come along and first of all, not to comment on the differences between um, their law and the law in Scotland. But the other thing too is that whenever you used to have a House of Lords um, sitting like that, you would have two Scottish judges sitting on it. But I mean, imagine that you were a judge in that position. You probably get used to working with your colleagues in England and maybe you just kind of softened or maybe you saw some benefits from their law and just decided to do something quite different. So that was the first controversy. And the second one then, in terms of how some of the easements are created, and I mean, I'll come to it in great detail, and I've actually brought along several textbooks just to show you what can kind of happen when somebody gets it wrong and it's perpetuated because there's an area of the law in relation to the granting of easements and I mean I taught it at Warwick with a team of colleagues and we always taught that it, it was developed in one way 
And the next place I worked, I did the same thing. And here we don't have team teaching, so I carried on. And then I switched to Dixon Fulk, and suddenly he's saying that it's it's created in a different way. And you know, you have that kind of eureka moment of thinking, oh my God, who's, who's right and who's wrong? So I went and I read from a lot of different books. And what I've actually found is this particular area of, of the way in which easements are, are granted or created. Um, one book will say one thing, another book will say something else, and they're just kind of ignoring each other. But there seems to be a definitive statement from one of the textbooks in which they handle it very delicately. And I, I'm going to bring that to your attention, because if you happen to go into, well, I mean, if you happen to do any legal writing in the future and you come across something that's wrong, sometimes it's good to adopt the subtle approach as opposed to sort of saying, you know, writing down about your best friend, well, my best friend, you know, or such and such a solicitor or such and such a barrister or such and such an academic was wrong. You want to maybe handle it a little bit more subtly. So anyway, I thought I'd give you a, a bit of a, an across the board. I never thought I, I'd be doing this in easements, but anyway, there you go. That's what makes law so interesting that you come across these controversies and that they seem to be without resolution. Uh, this is examinable. I won't be picking up on that in particular because, I mean, I, I don't see any benefit in torturing you with what kind of keeps me interested, do you know what I mean? It's going to be a fairly general question. Um, but I mean, an allusion to the controversy certainly looks very good. So I've brought that to your attention. I've mentioned some of the academics in it. When we come to it, um, I'll flag it up anyway. So anyway, um, this area of the law then is easements. And I think what I'll do just first of all, and then you're just going to have to be a bit patient and just kind of by the end of the class, hopefully I'll, I'll put it all together. So first of all, um, I'm just going to do a few diagrams just to show you how easements actually tend to arise. So an easement basically is a right of way. And the classic easement would be that there's a plot A and it's landlocked by plot B. Okay, so A has to get off the plot. So just supposing you buy plot A and you've got no means of getting out and B says, well, sorry, you know, you've bought the plot, so tough, you're certainly not coming across my land. You can get to, you can go to court. I mean, you might get agreement from B, you might pay them something, or you might go to court and force them to allow you to pass over their land, right? So this would be a classic easement right away. So then, um, A then is what's known as the dominant tenement. So I'll just put DT. In other words, it dominates the other property. And B is what's known as the servient tenement. So the tenement or the property that has to bear the easement. And we have come across these before. When I talked to you about the property register, um, just tying this back into the first topic that we did, Remember when land is registered, you've got a property register or you know, a part of the register that's divided up into the property section. You've got the proprietorship register and then you've got the charges register. So in these land, the existence of this right of way is a burden. So it would go into the charges register of these land. And then of A's land, it's a benefit because it's something additional to A. Like A does, doesn't just have their plot, they also have a right of way over somebody else's. So in A's, it would go into the property register because it adds to the description of what you actually get for your money. Okay? So then, and there's just two other things um, that I'll just say for now before I go into kind of the general conditions that apply across the board to all easements, is that basically you've got the possibility to grant easements. So imagine that A is the dominant tenement here, and B is the servient tenement. And 
and then Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, um, in this case, uh, where A is the owner of, or A buys this plot, uh, B would be the vendor that would make a grant. Um, so, sorry. The point that I wanted to make there is this is the grant of an easement. So, in other words, you sell a property, and you grant somebody else a right to cross over your property. Okay. And then in the second one, sorry, I'm just conscious that probably all of you can't see the voice of it, so just let me mess it up. So here, B is the vendor or the seller, and B is granting A an easement over his or her property. Vendor A is reserving an easement over these properties. Okay. Now, so granting is that you're giving somebody else a right over your property. Reserving is you're keeping a right back for yourself so that you can get off your property. Okay, but don't worry too much about that. We'll come back to it in more detail anyway later. So then, in terms of um, easements and what they are. Basically what they are is their third party rights over another person's land. So for example, a right of way, like the one to pass over somebody else's land, or a right of light, or a right to park your car in somebody else's land. Now, they often get listed together with profits, and we've come across profits before, I've just mentioned them. A profit is a right to go onto somebody else's land and take something off of it like the right to pick apples, the right to take turf, etc. But sometimes with a profit, you don't have to um, own adjoining land. The right can exist as what's known as in gross. So you don't have to, that, that's what in gross actually means, that you don't have to own adjoining land. But you can see here that it wouldn't make any sense to have an easement over somebody else's land if you weren't the adjoining owner. What right would you have? Now, you might want to pass over their land for some reason but in that case you'd negotiate a lease or you'd negotiate a license or something like that the category of right that you would be after if you didn't own adjoining land would be something else it wouldn't be an easement an easement is supposed to uh, benefit adjoining land and i mean it's kind of logical when i just mention that the entry in the register it's like an additional uh, benefit obviously to the dominant tenement and it's a burden on the Serbian tenement, so they have to be land that's some way adjoining. And as you can imagine, sometimes uh, what constitutes adjoining might be of some controversy as well, because it doesn't necessarily have to be right next to each other. It will depend on how it's benefiting the land. Now, um, the right, obviously, it's valuable in itself. And they run with the land and they bind successes and titles. So it's not a personal right like a license. It actually runs with the land. And obviously one of the things that we'll have seen very briefly too in land registration is now there are significant numbers of rules introduced changing most easements from an overriding interest as they were under the uh, 1925 Act to rights which have to be entered in the register. Now just one of the things that I'm going to point out, and this reflects how quickly this area is moving, a lot of what Dixon says in his book um, was written in the anticipation of there being electronic conveyancing. So that like when you would convey land and there was an easement, uh, there was a, like the easement would be entered into the property register or the charges register instantaneously. And obviously now that um, the like e-conveyancing has been put on hold, I think that that's going to change matters a little bit and future editions of Dixon might be quite different. Now, what actually makes this area pretty simple and like no matter what question you're answering, no matter how, how the question is, is phrased, whether it's an essay question or a problem question, there are four essential characteristics of all easements and they were laid down in a case, Real and Borough Park, in 1956, and Re-Ellenborough Park was just a case about um, 
there was a series of houses and it was uh, the claim was whether the residents of the houses had a right to walk around and use a private park and it was found that they did but um, what's interesting about this case is it lays down four essential elements for their for an easement to be recognized and this would be true of all easements bearing in mind though that easements are generally developed by case law so you know like everything sort of tends to get a bit stretched and it is an area of the law that's in a considerable state of flux so first of all there must be a dominant tenement and a servient tenement and it, i think it's very useful for you as well when you're preparing um, any exam question on this and when you're studying just be able to describe what they are in your own words we're not looking for any fancy language well first of all it supposes that there must be two plots of land so like if you just can big field and this belonged to sea but no easement right because well imagine that there's a highway there and it's surrounded by highway well there's no reason whatsoever for sea to have an easement and the other thing too um can you have an easement over your own property do you know what i mean like who, who am i claiming against am i claiming against myself now and obviously there are issues that come up if i transfer part of my land to somebody else down the line anyway so the dominant tenement it's the plot that enjoys the benefit of the easement and it kind of makes sense as well you know when you think of dominant that's the one that's going to get the benefit um, and the Serbian tenement is the plot that suffers the easement or is burdened with it. Now, the second condition is that the right must accommodate the dominant tenement. And again, what does accommodate mean? It means that the easement must benefit the dominant tenement or that it must be sufficiently proximate to the dominant tenement. So unusually in Rielenborough Park, some of the houses didn't actually adjoin the park but there was a sufficient connection between the right claimed and the properties in question. So again, like when you have an area of law like this that's developed on a case-by-case -case basis, there's always a matter of degree. And, you know, the, the, the courts could equally have decided um, in a different way. And each case will be decided on its fact, on its facts. So where the dominant tenement is a business easements may sometimes be recognized as in Moody and Steggles and this case involved the right to place a sign which advertised the business on neighboring land okay and then in Wong versus Bowman Property Trust um, this was a case in which uh, a lease was taken out for a Chinese restaurant in a basement but there were health and safety requirements that required that there be a vent now imagine that you were the proprietor of the restaurant and the lease so you took out the lease for a business purpose and then suddenly you find out that health and safety requires you to put a fence like a shaft up through the building the building is very very tall and you go along and you ask the multiple owners all the way along hey would you mind you know if i put a fence into the building and um, obviously they're not going to be very pleased but the thing is that you had got that lease for the purposes of your business. And what's interesting about this is because Wong didn't have, um, like, he didn't have an alternative to, you know, uh, I mean, th there was no alternative route for a vent. He actually was able to, uh, like, an easement to put in the vent was granted. So that's kind of quite interesting um, in terms of, you know, the extent to which courts will go to recognize um certain rights and again it's always on a case-by-case -case basis because that wouldn't be a general principle otherwise you could have a whole host of you know i don't know people coming along setting up restaurants in basements of very tall properties and it might become a bit of a problem and the other thing too i'll just mention there is you know you always think in cases like this well why has the legislature not intervened and we will see later on some legislative inter intervention which added a layer of complexity to the theory you know. Don't worry, at the end I will give you a look at one of my exam questions so you get an idea of like where this is all going to go. It is a bit complex, but it's also very, very interesting. Now, um, and then there's another example of an easement. It was related to the business, 
but it was not recognised, and that's the case of Hill and Tupper. And this was just where the tenant of land on a canal bank claimed that he had an exclusive right to put pleasure boats on the canal. And the defendant had also started putting boats on the canal. The tenant sued, claiming that he had an easement. And the claim failed because it was held that the right didn't accommodate the dominant tenant because the right being claimed was the business itself. It was disassociated from the land. What's the logic in that? You know, it can be decided either way, really. Uh, so there the principle is that the easement must benefit the land itself and not the owner of the land. So you can kind of have a right to uh, a business claimed as an easement that's not benefiting the land itself. Then in Wilkins and Lewis, uh, a right of way granted for one piece of land can't be used for the benefit of another piece of land. So it would be exclusive for that piece of land. Now, the third condition then is that there must be two different owners. And that's part of the principle that, as you're going to see with C, that might become problematic if at a later point in time. Um, no, sorry, actually, if. Just imagine. that C just has one way of exiting onto the highway, okay? And so for the sake of argument, that C is surrounded by fields, so there's only one exit here, right? And then C divides the land and sells off of D. You see, you've suddenly got a land lost plot now, just supposing that prior to selling off to plot, or sorry, to person D, C actually divides the land and retains ownership. And I mean, this might be for anything. Maybe C gets planning permission and builds a house here and has a field of either corn here or something like that. And then C later sells that land. You see, C might have been exercising a right of way over his or her own property. Do you see what I'm saying? Like that would never have been acknowledged as a right of way because presumably you can't take yourself to court over a right that you're exercising over your own land. But what I'm the point that I'm making here is that the use of land can change. So then C might then sell this plot off to D and suddenly you've got an issue with what this is and whether that can be converted into an easement for C's benefit. Now, before D came on the horizon, um, what this would be called is a quasi-easement, so a sort of easement, like a right that you're exercising against yourself, but it doesn't have any force or it doesn't, like you can't litigate it until something changes and that would be the ownership, okay? So when I say two different owners, it's not always as straightforward because obviously case law has developed this principle. And like um, another example would be what happens if you give a lease to somebody else, like you own the whole property, but can you exercise an easement against a lessee? And a lessee will have exclusive possession for the duration of the lease because remember when we talked about estates and land, you can have several different types of ownership uh, operating over the same piece of land simultaneously. So, um, uh, yeah, that's just uh, pretty straightforward, I think. Now, the fourth condition then is that the right must be capable of being the subject matter of a grant. And basically what that means is, can it be described? So for example, so supposing I came in here and I said, well, the room is very stuffy, can we open windows? And then I tried to make a claim against the university that I've got a right to open windows during my class. That's, can, can we put that in a deed? Can we describe that as a legal right? Obviously not. I mean, you might make a health and safety argument or I don't know, something like that. But in terms of being capable of being a subject matter of a grant, it has to be something that can be described. Um, I know that isn't, <laughs> it isn't very, um, very helpful, but like a right of way, which would have been recognized already in case law, a right to light. 
that's, uh, it, we, that would be an old uh, type of easement and would have a certain pedigree in terms of recognition. A right to park is a relatively newly recognised easement. Obviously, if you go back to 100 years ago, there was no right to park because there were no cars. So do you see the way in which technology as well might affect this otherwise very slow uh, moving area of the law? Now, the other thing too is it presupposes that there has to be a capable grantor, so somebody over the age of 18 of full capacity and a capable grantee. Um, and again, a definite right, um, it has to be a path over a field. You can't have, for example, an easement to have a good view or air through an undefined channel, the right to air, there's no such thing because air is intangible. Now, you might argue there, well, light is also intangible, but light can be cut off in a way that air probably can't, or, you know, again, you're, you're kind of distracting the boundaries. So the best way to deal with um, an area of law like this is just accept that when it's, when an area of the law is developed in the absence of rules on a case-by-case -case basis, it's always going to appear a little bit illogical. And so to sort of work through the cases, why and why not, easements have been recognized. And generally, like, if you're a bit confused, if you make a general sort of wishy-washy statement like, it's always a matter of degree, and courts will take various factors into consideration. Yeah, that's fine. You've been reflected. <laughs> no, but you know what I mean, because that's actually what they end up saying. So, you know, I'm just kind of reading it. Now then, um, when it comes to the recognition of new easements, new easements can be recognised. Now this is very interesting because that uh, Scottish house of, uh, case that uh, went to the House of Lords, the Scottish equivalent, there had been a general consensus from the Scottish Law Commission and also from academic commentators in Scotland that their equivalent of easements, which wouldn't be exactly the same, um, although I'm, I'm struggling to find what the difference is apart from the origin, that servitudes came from Roman law, and easements obviously are a development of the common law. But, um, and the English law dictionaries have been of no use. When you look up servitude, they say, oh, well, this is a the Scottish equivalent of an easement, but there are some differences. Um, easements, the category are, is not closed, so re, like recent easements, that have been recognised include, include the right to park on somebody else's land. So I just mentioned that there. And I've just put into the notes, and it's something that you can pick up later, does this approach explain the House of Lords' judgment in Moncrief and Jameson, which is the Scottish case, where the Scottish Law Commission had said that no new servitudes could be created. So they kind of came in and rode a bit roughshod over that. So negative easements are generally not recognized, so like restrictions on your use of land. So just supposing um, you had granted an easement, um, you had granted an easement to B, sorry, you're B, you're the vendor, you had granted an easement to A, and this is really, it's a right to walk over your land to access whatever is out here. But I mean, like, A can't come along and obstruct B's use of the land. Well, in principle anyway, because the reason that I teach this back to back with adverse possession is adverse possession is all about exclusive possession and keeping everybody else out. Easements certainly are not about that. Easements are a right to pass over somebody else's land, but like you can't set up a tent on the easement and decide, well, I'm going to sit down here for a few days or have a party or whatever. It's, it's not for that purpose. It's to benefit the land, not really to benefit the person. So it kind of makes sense then that negative easements wouldn't be recognized because they restrict the owner's right to use the land fully. And an example of a negative, like a restriction, would be that, okay, you know, you buy a house by the seaside and then you buy a plot in front of it and some adjoining plots, and you decide you're going to build high-rise buildings. Well, what if all your neighbors who have enjoyed their view for years, they can't stop you by getting an easement 
but what they could try to do is stop you by getting a restrictive covenant. So basically, like what I was talking about, the limits of easements, uh, easements are not licenses, they're not personal rights, they're on the land. And easements should not really restrict the right of the owner to do whatever they want with the land. Although, <laughs> as we're going to see in a minute, this is also a little bit controversial. Um, so no new negative easements will be recognized. The authority for that is fits and pairs. And the essence of an easement is that the dominant owner can do something on the servant owner's tenement. It doesn't put any obligation on the owner of the servient tenement to do any positive act, okay? Now, obviously, they can't obstruct, like just the owner of the servient tenement can't put up a huge fence stopping the exercise of the easement. And there's just an exception to this rule, is the obligation to maintain a fence to keep livestock in. And that was recognized in Crow and Wood. And again, I think that, um, it, and it doesn't apply to fencing in general, so again, you see the case by case law approach and the fact that a lot of these rights, um, they kind of turn up in circumstances which I suppose the courts, they haven't seen before. There's a certain justice demand because we're dealing with the common law. You don't have a huge number of rights which are described in legislation. So the common law often sort of seeks to do justice in cases like this. And that's why you'll see that it does appear to be a little bit chaotic. Now, having said all that about the right to pass over somebody else's land, that, um, that easements are not about exclusive possession, we go on to controversial easements. And there are a number of different controversial easements which have been recognized. And the first is the easement of storage, which obviously is controversial because, I mean, if you're storing something, it's occupying a particular part of the land, isn't it? So isn't that akin to exclusive possession um, of a part of the land? So the right to store coal in a shed was what recognised in Wright versus McKedden. Um, sorry? Uh, the right to store coal in a shed, sorry. And then the right to store trade goods on another person's land has also been recognized, and that's in Dice and Hay. But the right to store vehicles on adjoining land has not been recognized in Copeland and Greenhouse. And there's a lot of controversy about this. Um, Dixon does go into it in a certain amount of detail, so that the courts aren't really kind of sticking to their doctrines. And you can just read it for yourself. Just be aware of the fact that it's controversial whenever you've got courts developing rights like this. And I think actually, again, sorry to quote myself now, but it's all a matter of degree. Because if you're storing coal in a shed, and you see again, like the, the judge <coughs> might take a particular facts of the case into consideration there, maybe that the, that the owner of the dominant tenement has got very little storage space, or that there's a big shed that isn't being used, or whatever it is. Um, vehicles on adjoining land, you can see how that would be problematic because the vehicles are going to be very big for a start. They're going to occupy a significant part of the field. Um, so again, it's, it's a matter of degree. Now, this is one that I, I just think is hilarious. This is a, it's a 2002 case, and it's a case in which the right to cultivate flower beds on adjoining land was recognized as an easement. However, the court held that there was no right to a particular part of the Serbian tenement. Now, you just think that, um, I don't know, I always think about these people, these urban people, you know, who've got an idea about rural utopia, and they're always making these policies. I don't know, for some reason, I floated in and out of these groups as an observer for a number of years. And some of the stuff they come up with is completely and utterly uncle. That's the only way to describe it. Because you wonder, how could you possibly grant a right to cultivate flower beds on adjoining lands, but that there was no right to a particular part of the Serbian tenement? Do you have to suspend them? 
So you have to put them on wheels. You have to keep on running in and moving them in and out every hour. Like they have to rest. So it's completely illogical. But there you go. You know, and here's where um, I think the English slip up or lip and their particular um, grace with the use of their own language is very helpful. You know, that you don't say, well, this is bonkers, like I do. But you say, um, maybe something along the lines of the logic in extending the doctrine of easements to this extent is somewhat questionable or some such stuff. <laughs> maybe not in an exam, though, because that's a lot, an awful lot of words, right? But, uh, Anyway, so it's just that that's, it's completely inexplicable. But I suppose the problem is that the minute the common law gets a bit loose, you know, then where do you rein it in? And the answer is, well, you, you kind of don't. Now, and I suppose that um, Mulvaney and Gough probably fo like followed on from this long line of case law that has to do with the recognition of the easement of parking. And I mean, I think an awful lot of this, well, I mean, even look at the cities here, the parking is an absolute nightmare. So to have an easement of parking is hugely beneficial. And it's worth, a, you know, an awful lot of money. And I mean, parking spaces can be sold and bought, you know, from like in themselves. So to get an easement of parking recognized if you've got a business or a job or something like that in the city, is hugely valuable. So the right to park a car in a neighbor's land, it can be recognized as an easement, and the authority for that is Newman and Jones. And obviously, again, there's controversy over this, because if you're parking, you're occupying a particular place. Um, the right to light kind of is an easement which would, well, it would restrict the building or the, uh, the construction of buildings that would block the right to light, but it's not really exactly the same. That's kind of a restriction as opposed to, um, well, it's a restriction on the development of the Serbian tenement's land, but it's, it's not exactly the same as the imposition of having somebody else's cars parked. So the way in which they've actually tweaked this, again, is, is kind of hilarious, and it's always on a, a very much a case-by-case -case basis. So it may be refused if the right claimed is too extensive, as it was in Bachelor and Marlowe in 2001. So in this case, the claim to an easement involved the parking of six cars on a strip of land from 8.30 until 6.30, Monday to Friday. So an easement was not granted on that. Um, again, because it was considered to be too extensive, and that's kind of the only explanation given. So it's always going to be a question of degree. Um, in Hare and Gilman, the right to park a car on a forecourt, which could accommodate four cars, was recognised as, as an easement, providing that no specific bay was allocated, as this would amount to exclusive occupation. So, That's kind of the idea of the car park. So you've got four spaces. So you've got an easement to park on one of these, but not a particular one. So you'll always have to chance your luck. Um, a right to put a car on one of these, but not on any particular one, because that amounts to exclusive occupation, as opposed to parking your car there for 24 hours, which theoretically it doesn't. It, it's completely crazy, you know, but it's kind of it's always this difficulty that you're following a line of case law, I suppose, if you're a judge, and you're trying to do justice to both parties. So to avoid the right from becoming too extensive, the owner of the serving tenement can impose restrictions. The authority for that is Montrose court, uh, court Holdings. And then whether an easement is recognized or not is a matter of degree. And the more extensive the use, the less likely the right will be upheld and as an easement. And that's the Ladbroke uh, Retail Parts case in 1992. And then I come to this very interesting Scottish case of Moncrief and Jameson. And in this case, the House of Lords decided that there was an implied right to park vehicles on the Serbian tenement. And um, this was important because if the right had been denied, the Moncriefs would have to have parked 150 miles away, sorry, meters away. <laughs> 
and walk the remaining distance. So actually, I, I found um, an interview with, the solic with one of the solicitors in the case in the House of Lords who had kind of followed the case all the way along on YouTube. So I put a link to it. And uh, they actually showed the property and the particular problem that basically the, um, the, the Moncrease have to drive down this passageway uh, in order to get to their house. And there was really no other means of, of accessing the property. But the problem was that there wasn't any more than space for one car. So if you weren't going to allow the right to park, then it would mean that they'd always have to be dropped off. Do you see? They had a young family. So there are all these additional considerations coming into play. And basically what had happened in the Scottish courts was the Scots judges had looked at the law and said, well, this is a servitude. The law commission has said, the law commission of Scotland now had said that no new servitudes had, could be created. And they had also said that there was no such thing as a servitude of parking. So I suppose that, you see, there are a lot of other things you could do. I mean, in, in English land law, I suppose you could just grant some sort of a license or something like that. There would be some other device. You could grant something by estoppel. You could do something, but just not violate the doctrine. You see, but when it was appealed to the House of Lords, you see the English judges had no problem whatsoever in saying, yeah, there can be a right to park, even if there's only one day, because the list of easements in England and Wales wasn't closed. So you can imagine the, how the Scottish jurists have interpreted this. Um, didn't go down very well. And Lord Scott, I, I presume from the name that he was one of the Scottish judges, I think he was actually, said that the appropriate test was whether the servient owner retains possession and subject to the reasonable exercise of the right in question, control of the servient land. So whether the servient owner retains possession and control of the servient land um, and looking at a reasonable ex exercise, which means absolutely nothing or very little. An easement to park in a designated bay could therefore exist. Lord Newberg has stated that it would be dangerous to try and identify a degree of the degree of ouster that is required to disqualify a right from constituting a servitude or easement. So again, it's all a question of degree. And this case was, it, it was particular. Have a look at the video anyway, and it kind of will give you a physical description. Um, and then the law commissions, uh, the, the English and Welsh law commission commented that it would be illogical to accept that an easement could be granted where there were two or more car parking spaces and not where there was only one. But that really, it's kind of eating into the right of the servient tenement owner to have full control of their land. Because I mean, if somebody is just passing over your land, it's not gonna be continuous for a start. Parking is something quite different. So I thought that was just a bit interesting. So. There's a, a link to it, and um, I haven't put the notes up on Blackboard yet because I just want to include uh, one or two articles, short articles from the Scottish journals, just to give you an awareness that there is this tension, like if you do go to England and practice, that there might be tensions like that arising. Um, and also to so that you get familiar with looking for um, Scots law issues on West law, because this is a particular place, so I'll give you instructions to that. Um, and that's pretty Now then, I'm just going to do legal and equitable easements just before the break. And then when you come back, I'm going to show you the different ways in which the easements can be created. And this controversy between these different academic writers about the origin. And like, somebody has got it wrong. So, and I think actually the textbook writer has got it wrong. So, and he's glossed over it in a very, very clever way. So if you're, you know, if you write something in the future, and then you realize that, oh, whoops, I kind of got this wrong, you can learn from some very, very skilled professors and experts in the area of how you get over that and move on. <laughs> I really, I didn't expect to come across it. And the other thing too was, I've, I mean, I've asked loads of academics off the record, including a, a former external examiner, and hit the wall. Absolutely no feedback whatsoever. So, might be an interesting dissertation to do at some point. Now, um
um, yeah, so that's that was just um, one thing from Jameson. So it's just the issue again of English and Welsh easements, servitudes, and different opinions getting in the way. So then remember back to the Law of Property Act. Um, for easements to be legal, they have to come within the rules laid down in the Law of Property Act, Section 1. So they can only exist for the duration of a leasehold or a freehold. So like easements for life can only be equitable, right? Remember the way in which legal estates were reined in. You can't have a, a legal estate for life anymore. You can only have a freehold, so an estate that technically goes on forever, or a leasehold, one that's limited uh, in time, but to a specific time. And then legal easements can only be created by statute, deed, and sorry, can you just add in there, uh, registered disposition, so just put a stroke after deed, registered disposition, I'll, I'll correct that afterwards, and also by prescription. Now, I'm, I'm going to bring this to your attention now, and I'll say it again um, when we're dealing with prescription. In exam answers in the past, I kept on coming across this thing in adverse possession that students would add in something about nec di, nec clan, nec precario. It's a principle in easements that Irish judges have applied to adverse possession, right? I have never come across it in the English courts. So when you're answering a question, or if you're answering a question on adverse possession, I do not want to see that it comes up by nec di, nec clan, nec precario. It doesn't. And I don't know whether they went away and they kind of looked at the origins of these two doctrines, you know, this idea of rights over another's land, because at first possession, it's very confusing, but it's called prescription in Scotland. So either they were very, very learned judges in Ireland who didn't then actually explain themselves very well, but they read something very quickly, popped it up, and introduced a doctrine into Irish land law, which, I mean, in that particular area would derive or like, well, it did derive from English land law, like it were possession. And they've added in something that there are no roots for it in, in, in English land law. So I will come back to that, but uh, please. <laughs> Otherwise, the external examiner will be like, what are you teaching these people? Sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> you said uh, it be created by uh, statute deed. So registered disposition. The reason is that um, this kind of goes back to uh, unregistered land. And of course, now because, well, there's this ongoing controversy about um, how easements <coughs> will actually bind successes in title, that they have to be entered on the register. And of course, that whole discussion takes place in the context that e-conveyancing makes the registration of easements simultaneous. So the idea of them being legal has just disappeared. But that's not now really the case. And, uh, it's like, you know, when they're trying to kind of move this whole area away. I, do you know what I actually refer to as in another area of the law that I think is called the news factor, like MS? You see, <laughs> okay, I suppose women didn't want to be defined necessarily by their marital status. And so in order to get rid of this problem of myths and misses, the Germans took a very intelligent approach. They just got rid of it. <coughs> and everybody was misses for a while and they were a bit uncomfortable. But, you know, you get over it. No, in English, what they did was in introduced a new term. So the problem is the minute you get a new term, then you've got a third category of people. Do you see? So you're either single or married or <laughs> this dodgy category <laughs> that doesn't quite fit either. So my point is that this effort to sort of say we're not talking about equitable and legal anymore. It's not quite true, because they keep on saying this, but then saying, ah, oh, yeah, but we still need to talk about this. So anyway, that's why I, I had omitted to put in registered disposition there. So again, the, the, the creation of legal easements, and I will refer to them as legal easements, even though technically, like, they're now registered dispositions or part of that, uh, has been quite curtailed. So consequently, the number of equitable easements has increased. So equitable easements, they can, their easements, I mean, they can be created in a number of ways. If you only hold an equitable estate, you can only grant an equitable easement because, you know, there's a maximum, a maximum in law that you can't grant more than you've got. 
So a legal interest would be more than what you've got if you've got an equitable interest. Um, and then if the easement is not within the definition of section one, subsection two of the Law of Property Act, which defines legal easements, then it's going to be equitable. And if it's not made by deed, and remember for anything that's not made by deed, it now has to satisfy the Law of Property Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1989, which I've mentioned to you before. And you see in the case of purchasing an estate, if you didn't have a legal or registered estate, you might have an equitable one if you had had a contract. If the contract didn't satisfy the, uh, the requirements of this particular legislation that says that all transactions uh, for the sale and purchase of land has to be in writing, if it was for an estate, you see, you might then have a trust. But if it's for an easement, you have nothing unless the courts would recognize an easement by a stopper, which they sometimes do, like if there had been an action to the detriment. But again, here you see the, uh, the effect of land registration and the effect of trying to rationalize this area of the law. So could we take a five minute break and I'll go on to the creation of easements and this controversy in the second half. Okay. Oh, getting all of it? I said, you know, you're getting all of it. Yeah. It's an audio. I need to hear it back. Yeah. Hey. I didn't see you come in. Oh, she's, she gets so airy well, he talks about me to advance her students all the time. I wonder how to go on and what was that? Is that the middle of it? That's a nice talk. Keep an eye on my yeah, Yeah, 
I started looking around for the person who needs to go back to wave after it. Anyway. <laughs> okay, okay, I take the hint. But I was first in, so the rest of them shouldn't have gotten any better. Anyway, so six people in the lift haven't gone. Another five minutes and we'd have mounted a rescue mission. <laughs> Thanks, that's very good of you. Now, um, what I'm going to do now, if it's all right, I'm going to clean off my artwork and just start um, showing you the different ways in which legal easements can be created. So you need to worry about statute. Statute is just basically the easements that are created by Act of Parliament occasionally. None of them come up um, in the books. So it's really kind of just be aware that this is one of the ways in which uh, legal easements are created. So it's the deed register disposition and prescription which are the important ways. So now <clears throat> in my diagrams in the first um, in the first part of today's lecture, I was talking about granting an easement and reserving an easement. So that's the first division here. And like Dixon's book, I mean, Dixon is a good writer and I like the book from the point of view that, um, like in terms of the books that I've read, it's laid out pretty well. Thompson is, I, I actually much prefer Thompson, but I think the book isn't as kind of user friendly and he gets into some sort of arguments that are very controversial and they're, they're a bit unnecessary, like for the, the time that I've got. But the one thing I will say about Dixon is that if you're following this, it's quite different to how he's done it. And I actually think I'm better. But anyway, you might totally disagree. And that's absolutely fine. It's just that you get the information into your head. Um, I'll, I'll show you in a minute how he actually um, how he actually categorizes the the different interests. But uh, this is how I've done it, and um, I've kind of I've gone back over it several times to to see can it be improved. Um, I just think that this is a simpler method. But anyway, as I say, each to their own. Now, so then with. Grant and reservation, you've got express and implied for both because you can expressly state it or you can find yourself in a situation that the, the intention hasn't been expressed in either the reservation or the grant and so then you end up in court or then you end up negotiating, okay? So, Now, an express grant, that's actually the most straightforward, that it's actually stated in the conveyance that, that this easement has been granted. So I don't ex exactly know how to express that, but I'll just say express, so it's stated, okay? That's what I mean. Now, this is the controversy that I'm going to come back to in a minute. It's section 62 of the Law of Property Act, 1925. Sorry, I don't think I've ever this. <clears throat> uh, 
then the implied grant is necessity common intention And then what's known as the rule in Wheeldon and Burroughs, which I'll come back to that. Again, an express reservation would be one stated in the conveyance or one expressly given. So I just put stated. So another provision of the Law of Property Act 1925 is section 65. And then implied reservation. So you've impliedly reserved an easement to yourself because you forgot to do it. And basically you've landlocked yourself can also come up through necessity and common intention. Now, as you can imagine, an implied reservation for common intention would be very, very rare, because how can you possibly sell off a part of your own property and leave yourself landlocked and then go to court and say, oh, well, we actually had an agreement that I would reserve an easement, but whoops, I forgot to say it. And you see, the thing is, easements are quite valuable, or they can be quite valuable property rights. So imagine if you bought a piece of property, and the next thing, the person who sold it to you is trying to sort of say, we had an agreement that I'd have an easement to cross over your land, or park their, my car on your land, or whatever. You could understandably be quite annoyed about that. And if it was a right to access the highway, if there was any other way that the person claiming the implied reservation by common intention could access the highway, even if it was very, very inconvenient, the courts won't go for it. They really will only concentrate on necessity. Okay? So this is a very, very rare category. So you kind of need to worry about it a little bit less. So I'm just going to, yeah, this is the, the big controversy here anyway. And I brought in a few different textbooks to just give you kind of a flavor for, for what to do if you publish something and then afterwards you think, whoops, why did I say that? Because the statute, you can more or less forget about it, just except to be aware that this is one of the ways in which legal easements can be created. Um, deed or registered disposition, there's some controversy. Um, I taught this, I taught land law um, at Warwick University, first of all, and I started teaching in 2000. So I taught with a team, and we had always described this section 62 of the Law of Property Act as giving rise to an easement like by express grant. And I'll tell you what it is. It's that if um, an easement hasn't been expressly granted, so it hasn't been stated, you've got this section 62. And what it basically says is that it, it covers general words implied in conveyances, OK? So you see, the minute you use the word implied, I mean, the first time I saw this, well, why are you calling it an express grant if, number one, the the section itself talks about words being implied into conveyances and what it says is that a conveyance of land shall be deemed to include all buildings, um, fixtures, liberties, privileges, easements, whatsoever, uh, appertaining or reputed to appertain to the land at the time of the conveyance. And it's always been interpreted as an express grant, so that it wasn't actually given to you in a document, that section 62 would kick in and allow you to claim uh, that there had been the grant of an easement and that it was express. Now, that seems a bit bizarre. And then I went on and I taught at the University of the West of England, and this was always an express grant. 
Thompson has always described it as an express grant, and we used this book. Um, I mean, I used this at work, and I used this one, Mackenzie and Phillips, uh, at the University of the West of England, and they had always described it as an express grant. So, anyway, but the thing was that Dixon's book, then you know, and publishers they they tend to send you inspection copies. So, I liked the layout of Dixon's book. So, about a year ago or two years ago, whenever it was that I took it over, I was just kind of reading through it, and the next thing, implied grant. And you know the way you, well, you possibly don't, but you have that heart-stopping moment and you start frantically going through all the past books that you've had and you're thinking, oh my God, how did this happen, you know? Um, they can't have all been wrong, those famous last words. So anyway, I've just put in here um, the the academics that actually do say that it's an express grant. And the thing about Mackenzie and Phillips is that they have an authority for it that goes back to 1926, right? And Thompson, I mean, one of his earlier books, which would have been written about 2004, so I thought, well, I give him a bit of a benefit of the doubt because the Land Registration Act 2002, it's an extensive piece of legislation, and it may be just that they're kind of, like you basically have to update your textbooks about every two years in the UK. So how much you actually cover when, they're, they're very, very busy. I mean, they're a hell of a lot busier than academics here, despite what you hear about workers in the public sector, all this, you know, and, uh, I won't get into that now. Um, but, you know, it's it's kind of very, very structured. So it's a huge amount of work. And certainly, I think that um, Dixon's book in places, it hasn't quite taken account of the fact that there's a hold now on e-conveyancing, right? So, but I was kind of reading what he had to say about it. And yeah, so anyway, he starts talking about this um, as an implied grant. Going back, several of his editions has described it as an implied grant. And this time he's got a footnote which seems to justify his position. So I've been kind of doing my own reading on this. Um, and I basically, I'm, first of all, like Thompson has always said that it's, a, it's an express grant. And he's got kind of a good legislative pedigree because he says that he goes back to the Conveyancing Act 1881 and he said that then it was necessary when conveying land to include expressly all rights which were pertinent to that land, but since that legislation that it wasn't. And he doesn't actually seem to mention this case that Mackenzie and Phillips do. So then Mackenzie and Phillips, they say that that this, this is uh, also an express grant. And in the latest edition of their book, they've kind of glossed it by saying, by acknowledging that there's controversy, right? And I, I mean, it's just a short passage. I'll just read you what they have to say. Um, so it's nature of a grant under section 62. And they talk about section 62 operates by importing certain words into the conveyance. It has the effect of making an express not implied grant of the easement of profit, and they, they refer to that case, uh, Greg and Richards, which was on the last slide. It is for this reason that the Land Registration Act 2002 provides that the requirement to complete an express grant of an easement by registration does not apply to easements arising under this, because you see, how could it expect you to register these easements if they're arising under legislation? right? Do you see what I'm saying there? Like that when you make a conveyance, you're not going through a statute. The statute here in this case is giving you a right. And so it could only become incumbent on you to register on a subsequent conveyance because it must be something that kicks in a split second after the conveyance. Do you see what I mean? Like a legislative provision can't become effective until there's been a conveyance. Therefore, the conveyance comes first and the grant comes second. It would have been slightly less important had there been simultaneous e-conveyancing with the registration of all the interests in the afternoon, but all of a sudden we're in a situation where that is not necessarily the case. And they go on to say, despite this, some textbooks describe easements acquired by virtue of section 62 as being impliedly granted. And there are several recent decisions in which judges have referred to 62 as giving rise to an implied grant. 
although without any discussion of the matter. At present, the question of classification does not appear to be of any great significance, but we mention it here in case you're confused by it. Why didn't I put this textbook on the course? It's because it would drive you absolutely off the walls. They've got this scenario of six different houses. And like, from the minute I opened it, I thought, okay, like, I'm confused by their scenario, so I can't even get to the law behind it. But sometimes, you know, anyway, this is what uh, Dixon has to say. And I actually think that Dixon's chapter isn't that great, so just bear with me. I'm going to put the notes on Blackboard over the next day or two, and I'll see if I can just get a good few articles that will cover it a bit better, because, frankly, he's not great. Uh, under the Land Registration Act 2002, an, ex an easement expressly granted as of a registered estate must be entered on the title of the Serbian land in order to take effect as a legal interest. Failure to do so renders the easement equitable. And then he goes on and he says, an easement is not expressly granted by reason of the operation of section 62 of the LPA. See the Land Registration Act 2002, section 27. Seven. Okay, bear with me now a second until I go to the end of this. because I just added in this at the end so section 27 of the land registration act says dispositions required to be registered so this section that um, that Dixon refers to is the, the subsection 7 here, first of all, you have to read that in conjunction with the other one above it. So in subsection 2D, the reference to express grant does not include grant as a result of the operation of section 62 of the Law of Property Act. But that doesn't mean necessarily that those easements are not made by express grant. And I actually think that you've got it wrong. That um, then the express grant or reservation of an interest of a kind falling within the section of the law of property act. So basically, what he's, he's relying on this is that he has read this as to say that the registration is putting these outside, and so they must be implied. And I don't actually think that he's read it right. So anyway. <laughs> Food for thought. Don't worry, there won't be a specific question on that, so you needn't worry about it. Hold on, let me see if I can find my. Uh... I think this is beginning to get like the lift. Very nice. But I mean, it's just, it's very interesting. I've, I've actually never come across that. I mean, sometimes there are different interpretations. But I mean, here in this case, somebody has got it wrong. And Mackenzie and Phillips seem to be very, very sure that they've got it right and that the judges are just, because if, if you looked at that off the top of your head and you weren't an expert in land law, you'd think, well, something that doesn't expressly state something must be implied, it's logical. But it is express. And then, anyway, that was the way of suddenly criticizing your colleagues without naming them. Some academic commentators, blah, blah, blah. Be a bit careful about that. No, you have to think about it because, uh, well, anyway, I won't say too much about the academic personality, but sometimes, like, if they have it in for you, <laughs> that's it for, you know, the rest of your life job. So anyway, um, so anyway that, that is the express grant. I'm classifying it as an express grant. You can just acknowledge the controversy, and I've kind of made it easy for you there by just telling you some of the academic commentators the interesting thing as well is that Gray, who is a real giant in land law, also describes it as an implied grant. So where that mystery began, or that equivocation. Can I just ask you, if the effect of that, therefore, so if, if, it, if say, for instance, if it was a court ruled that it wasn't an express grant, mm. does that mean then that the grant doesn't exist unless it falls in under one of the three categories of an implied grant? Or is it a case that if it's not expressed, it's automatically implied anyway? The thing about section 62 
is it's been problematic in that it upgrades a whole host of different interests into easements. So there have been cases of people just enjoying a license. So you can use the right of way over my property. Then there's been a conveyance and suddenly the license is upgraded into an easement. So yeah, potentially this could be narrower actually. You have to go for maybe something along the lines of common intention. And actually that's a very good question because there's a lot of academic discussion too as to whether there's any difference between um, the rule in wheels and in boroughs, which I'll get to in a second, and section 62. And there were some doctrinal differences. Section 62 has a broader application in that it applies to easements and profits. Wheels and boroughs doesn't because it's a case, so it's narrower. And then the other thing is that uh, section 62 originally applied where the ownership was in separate hands and wheels and boroughs doesn't necessarily uh, have that restriction because it was a, there was a quasi easement, basically the, the, the two plots were originally in single ownership and one was sold off first. So now what, like what Thompson would recommend is just amalgamate the two, stop having this distinction. But then you start breaking down categories and actually... Um, well, there's somebody looking at it for the first time. Yeah. It, it looks to the labor sort of like just a, a, a spat amongst the academics as the terminology, you know? Yeah. It, it doesn't really amount to anything in the end of the day. Except that this is broader. It applies to profits as well. Okay. And also, sorry, I'll just... Uh, but you see, with, with issues like this, you never know until it's tried. You know, and so you can get a judge that will sort of take that considerably further. So, sorry now. Um, so it can have a real effect on the nature of the easement or whether it exists in it. It could, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And also the, the whole thing about, th this is another example of like, there being some controversy as to what needs to be registered because if you granted an easement in a document, right, um, then that would have to be entered on the register. There would no longer be an overriding interest. But these ones have been, they've been accepted from that category by the Land Registration Act apparently, and Dixon seems to be relying on that to say, well, these aren't express easements at all. And I don't think he's right, you know? Um, Anyway, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll put a link to section 62 and I'll, I'll probably end up this thing. I mean, it's, you know, there's a load of verbiage as well in this and when you read it, um, you know, your, your square brackets are very, are very handy. But um, it says literally, um, a conveyance of land shall be deemed to include and shall by virtue of this act operate to convey with the land all buildings, erections, fiction, fixtures, commons, hedges, ditches, fences, ways, waters, watercourses, liberties. So that's all right. I mean, that's all pretty logical stuff. You know, of course, you're not going to not have the ditch that is on your property. But then it goes on. Privileges, easements, rights. Like, what's a right? It does it run with the land? Who knows? Um, advantages whatsoever. So that's very broad. Appertaining or reputed to appertain to the land or any part thereof, or at the time of the conveyance, demised, occupied, or enjoyed with, or reputed, or known as part of parcel, or of person to the land, or any part thereof. So like, if you have some sort of right that you've been exercising, uh, which pertains to the land, it isn't an easement. And I mean, an easement is a powerful right, because it's a property right, it runs with the land, but this has been used to upgrade licenses into proprietary rights, which they wouldn't have done beforehand. So, I suppose really what we're talking about here is like potentialities more than anything. But um, the thing is that if you're answering a question on this area and you're able to make a quick reference to controversy of this nature without me expecting you to have to go away and read 200 pages, it looks very good. And the external examiner would be very impressed. And the other thing too is I am um, 
well, it just shows that, like, I, I, I don't know, I, I just think it's, it's absolutely fascinating to come across something like that when you've been teaching it for quite a while. What if we were using different books from the start? And then I came across all the other stuff and would have been like, oh, sugar, maybe I've got to switch to some other course or something. And I guess in a lot of different areas of the law, you wouldn't have that problem because you wouldn't have so much detail and, I mean, I don't know. Certainly, I, I don't think there's that level of, of detail in, in anything else I've ever taught. You know, it's only land really. And then the significance of it, obviously, is huge, potentially. Now, um, can I ask you something? Yeah, sure. You know, with all those terms you just listed right there with the section 62, is it, doesn't that make it somewhat implied, or is it just going to be expressed only? And you see, the, the thing about it is that you would think that that that, that would be an implication, because yeah. it's not said. But because, because it comes under the statute, and it's been given this interpretation by judges and academics, it's deemed to be an express land. And the definitive statement on that is Mackenzie and Phillips, that they've got this case, and they use that as the applied. So, but the interesting thing is that that case isn't quoted in all the textbooks. So it's like they really went digging. And they are practitioners as far as I know. So, you know, there's a benefit to having people who, you know, who go into things in that detail. The other thing too, I just thought I'd mention, um, there's a guy called Gale, and his, he wrote this book and it's always referred to as Gale on easements. So whenever there's any case with any controversy, Gale is referred to. So there is a career route that you carve out a niche and you just concentrate on an obscure area. But then the thing is, the benefit of that is that um, you get quoted in all the, you get quoted by all the, the judges because you're the only person. I mean, could you imagine like, you know, spending your life researching easements? Well, it would be interesting. Well, it's become fascinating, but I mean, I certainly couldn't see myself go away of going away on, you know, making a career out of it. But I mean, everybody's different. And uh, like, I do have a friend in Scotland who is doing his PhD on, uh, basically on adverse possession in Scottish law, which is much more restricted because it hasn't developed through the common law. So, you know, you can sort of do take a very, very doctrinal course on a particular area like that. Like there's no equivalent of Gale on restrictive covenants. So I'm just saying that it gets you an awful lot of kudos in academia if you carve out a niche like that. And then you're always the person who's working, you can use it for promotion. You know, so anyway, I just, uh, Oh, I'd mentioned that. But you see, look, basically when you when you're answering an exam question and you're able to name drop like that, it looks seriously impressive. And you know, I want to say it. Anyway. Now, so then um So then you have um, the, so a controversy about that, but we're leaving it here for the time being. Then you've got implied grant, and that comes from necessity, uh, common intention, or the rule in Wheelton and Burroughs. So mutual intention or common intention, the case that I mentioned earlier where there was a um, a vent basically put up through a building that was uh, a common intention or a mutual intention implied grant because the thing was that if you were the owner of the Chinese restaurant you got a lease from the owner of the building um, then there must have been a common intention when they knew that like the purpose for you taking the lease uh, that you know that you would have to comply with health and safety, etc. Now that's why that one didn't fall in under necessity. It's not just about the person needing the easement. It's also kind of putting an onus in a way on the owner of the premises that well, you can't go giving leases for restaurants unless you give the person everything they need to conduct their business. So then uh, the third one, it's just again, um, because this is kind of a quite haphazard area of the law,
the rule in Wilden and Burroughs is one of the other ways in which a grand grenade.